Well, that's not, and here's my, yeah. you know, stuff, stuff like that. Right. So, uh, how about... Tell me when you're ready. Okay. Hello, I'm Bjorn Skaftesen from Abraham Lincoln Bookshop in Chicago. We are the oldest antiquarian bookshop dealing in Lincoln, Civil War, and the U.S. Presidency. Thrilled to be in Milwaukee today at the Milwaukee Civil War Roundtable talking about Ambrose Bierce and the Battle of Shiloh. Of the Chicago Civil War Roundtable. For you, sir. I noticed. <laughs> In fact, uh, thank you, Frank, and, and, and thank you, Van. And uh, I was just sitting there thinking uh, about how wonderful it would be for us to, to hear the competition as I, as I present our very R-rated version of the Battle of Shiloh provided to us by the great writer Ambrose Bierce, the great misanthrope of the late 19th, early 20th century, Ambrose Bierce. It sounds like we may have missed him, though. But uh, nevertheless, uh, it is uh, a great privilege to return to the Milwaukee Civil War Round Table. I thank you very much for inviting me back. And. Uh, uh, and I also wish to extend my congratulations uh, to my friend Doug Dahman and to the great people at the Kenosha Civil War Museum. Again, well done. There's uh, uh, hardly enough that we could say about the great work that you've been doing down there. What we're going to do today, tonight, is a little bit of a experiment. And it is an experiment of trying to take a battlefield hike, which is the, uh, the medium that I am most familiar with in interpreting the Civil War, leading, uh, leading groups across uh, a battlefield, as, uh, as I did when I was a ranger with the National Park Service, and then as I do as a volunteer for the Shiloh National Military Park every year. And then also to marry that with a form of battlefield hike that we experimented with when I was at Shiloh 2004 through 2006. Uh, and I was grateful that they would let me experiment with that. And that is what we called, what we thought of as the primary source battlefield hike. We were going to take a single primary source and follow that soldier across the battlefield. Rather than taking quotes from that soldier's uh, uh, writings, we would present the writing in a whole. And we would take people to the spot where the events being narrated uh, occurred. And uh, we decided uh, that there would be two, uh, two such programs we would do at Shiloh, one for a Union soldier, one for a Confederate soldier. The terms uh, had to be that the soldier was a good writer who had left behind a good story. Uh, one of them, we wanted to be a Union soldier, and one of them, we wanted to be a Confederate soldier. And uh, these were the terms. And then they also had to have covered 
a lot of the battlefield. If the soldier's experience happened to be that uh, he got up in the morning and was wounded and then returned to Corinth, then that wouldn't be much of a Shiloh battlefield hike. Uh, we determined that the Union soldier we would follow across uh, the battlefield would be Ambrose Bierce, the great muckraking yellow journalist of the late 19th and early 20th century. Bitter Bierce, author of the Devil's Dictionary and uh, many, other fine, uh, many other fine things. Bierce was a sergeant in the 9th Indiana Regiment and he left behind a vivid description of his experience on the second day of fighting at Shiloh. Uh, our Confederate was uh, a gentleman uh, that uh, a gentleman that I presume we all know, Henry Morton Stanley, uh, who uh, made, his, uh, uh, made his name famous in Africa with the Dr. Livingstone, I presume, adventure. Uh, uh, a English adventurer who had fought, I should say this, a Welsh, a Welsh adventurer who had fought as a Confederate at Shiloh. We're not going to go into Henry Morton Stanley today. We are going to follow the experiences of Ambrose Bierce. Uh, his essay that he wrote in, uh, I believe he wrote it in uh, the 1890s. I don't know the exact date. Didn't write it down. Uh, appeared in, I believe, the San Francisco Examiner. And uh, it was a reminiscence of his experience as a sergeant at the Battle of Shiloh. As a soldier that fought on the second day of the battle, he belonged to the army of General Don Carlos Buell. Uh, that is the army that came to reinforce General U.S. Grant's Army of the Tennessee. And uh, reinforcing Grant's army, they fought on the second day of the battle. They fought on the eastern side of the battlefield. I have a map here that I'm going to show in a moment, and we'll look at that. Uh, the story that I tell, word for word, the edited version of Bierce, uh, it would probably take over an hour to read an unedited version, and uh, I, don't, I didn't want to do that, and I don't think you wanted to hear it. Uh, so I, I cut it down to a, a, a more vivid and concise uh, uh, version that is better for the spoken word. He wrote it to be read, not to be spoken. So I've taken some uh, uh, editorial uh, liberties with the text so that it sounds better uh, spoken. Uh, it reads at a little over 40 minutes, between 40 and 45, if it, if it happens the way that I rehearsed it. Um, and as we go through it, we will also look at images of the battlefield uh, where the text is taking place. If there's anybody that cannot see the screen because of me, uh, and I need to be here to be near my computer, uh, by all means, feel free to move around or, or get where you can see, see the screen. Also, because it takes a little time to get to Bierce, and Bierce is the star of our show today, I'm going to try to do as little uh, introductory material as I can. Uh, we want to get right to this as soon as we can. But it is worth knowing uh, some things about Ambrose Gwinnett Bierce. He uh, was born in eight, 1840, I believe, uh, in Meigs County, Ohio. That is the Ohio Hill Country uh, on the upper Ohio River. Uh, belonged, to, uh, uh, belonged to a family of uh, deeply fundamentalist conservative Christians. Uh, so much so that uh, his father managed to have, uh, his parents managed to have 10 children and name all of them after Bible characters whose names began with A. Uh, so uh, Ambrose was simply one, I'm sure. There was an Absalom and, 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 and many others. Um, Ambrose turned out to be a very, a very poor Christian. <laughs> uh, especially as the fundamentalist evangelical uh, uh, doctrine went. Uh, and uh, always, always a fractious member of the family, always a rebellious child, and eventually uh, uh, when the family moved to uh, Indiana, 
uh, he took the first opportunity to go live with an uncle, uh, Lucius Beers. Uh, and that uncle Lucius Beers happened to uh, live uh, in uh, uh, South Central Ohio and happened to be uh, the neighbor of a farmer by the name of John Brown. And uh, Lucius Beers, in fact, gave John Brown the uh, cast off army artillery swords that Brown and his boys used to hack apart the, uh, their political enemies at Pottawatomie Creek, Kansas. Um, so, very early, young Beers was meeting some very interesting people and learning to describe the world the way he, the way he experienced it and the way he encountered it. Uh, as you can probably imagine, by the time he was 19 years old and the Civil War started, he was a young man looking for adventure, and he enlisted immediately in the 9th Indiana Infantry. 9th Indiana Infantry was a 90-day, uh, 1861, 90-day uh, regiment, and young Beers, who had had one semester of training at a uh, high school military academy, uh, that rated him as a sergeant and he ended up as a sergeant in the 9th Indiana, went and fought in the uh, West Virginia campaign. After the 90 days, the 9th Indiana Regiment re-enlisted as a three-year regiment, and Sergeant Beers became first sergeant of Company C of the 9th Indiana, and that is the role he played at the Battle of Shiloh. Uh, a sergeant, therefore a, uh, uh, he had command of a, uh, a squad, and uh, as we see in the writing, he will describe how he commanded that squad as a skirmisher during part of the battle. Um, how Beers got to Shiloh, of course, the 9th Indiana was part of General Don Carlos Buell's Army of the Ohio. Uh, they were posted in Kentucky in the summer of 1861 and the fall and winter of 1862. Following the fall of Fort Donaldson to General Grant's army in February of 1862, the Confederates evacuated uh, Kentucky, Beers will tell us about it here in a minute, uh, and uh, evacuated all the way through Nashville. Uh, so Sergeant Beers and his comrades marched down from Bowling Green, Kentucky. They marched right into Nashville. They took possession of that, and then finally they got their orders, General Don Carlos Buell, their commander, got their orders to march overland from Nashville to Pittsburgh Landing on the Tennessee River, where they fortunately arrived uh, just in time uh, to participate in the last moments of the first day of the Battle of Shiloh. Sergeant Beers' participation in the battle occurred only on the second day, and that is what he will narrate for us in just a moment. I called Beers' writing R-rated, and if, uh, is there anybody in the room, by a show of hands, that, is, that considers themselves familiar with the writing of Ambrose Beers, uh, a fan of the writing of Ambrose Beers? Then you know there's a reason why they called him Bitter Beers, and there's a reason why he's called a misanthrope. Uh, he, uh, he was a very, um, uh, very angry writer with a very poisoned pen. And woe, uh, woe to the political figure or public figure that he happened to disagree with in public. He had, uh, uh, I think, poison pen is the, the best way to describe it. He also had a very sentimental streak. He was a fine writer. The poison pen does not simply describe a man who hates everybody. A uh, misanthrope doesn't simply describe somebody who hates everybody. He was a very talented writer, and he chose to write in the voice that he, that he wrote in for, for reasons, and he was very good at it. Um, so when it came time for him to remember to write something uh, uh, autobiographical, he turned to the Civil War. And, uh, he, and we're going to look at his reminiscence of the Battle of Shiloh. He called it What I Saw of Shiloh. And uh, there he is as a 19-year-old sergeant. Um, he later became a lieutenant and then, uh, and then after the war uh, went to uh, San Francisco, where he became the uh, journalist. Very quickly, we're going to look at our map, 
And whenever I use one of these maps by the Civil War Trust, I like to shout out to the Civil War Trust. Uh, they make these fantastic maps that are great for these uh, talks like this. <coughs> and you can download them from their website. They give them away. And uh, all they ask is that you support battlefield preservation. And I'm going to take a moment right now to speak on behalf of the Civil War Trust. Please support battlefield preservation. This is the battlefield of Shiloh. It shows the second day's battle. And we will see, the, the, uh, uh, from the point of view of the map, we will follow Sergeant Pierce across the right side of that map as you were looking at it. I'll go point. Pittsburgh Landing is here. Sergeant Pierce and the 9th Indiana will fight their way through these deep ravines along the Hamburg-Savannah Road and finish the battle in a terrible, terrible hand-to-hand -hand fight in the Daniel Davis Sweet Field along here. So that is the axis of advance that they, uh, that the 9th Indiana and Ambrose Pierce will take. Uh, we will have a chance to look at another map later, but we will not do too much uh, map following. We really wish to listen to, uh, to Sergeant Pierce tell his story, which we shall do now. Uh, the, the essay is written in 12 parts, and uh, so it gives me a chance to stop and catch my breath between parts, and then, I will, and then each part takes us across the battlefield, and I'll give you a new image each time. So this is What I Saw of Shiloh by Ambrose Bierce. Part one. This is a simple story of a battle. Such a tale as may be told by a soldier who is no writer to a reader who is no soldier. The morning of Sunday, the sixth day of April, 1862, was bright and warm. Reveille had been sounded rather late, for the troops were to have a day of rest. The men were idling around the embers of their bivouac fires, some preparing breakfast, others looking carelessly to the condition of their arms and accoutrement. Still others were chatting with indolent dogmatism on that never failing theme, the end and object of the campaign. Sentinels paced up and down the front with a lounging freedom of stride. A few limped unsoldierly in deference to blistered feet. At a little distance, in rear of the stacked arms, were a few tents, out of which frowsy-headed officers occasionally peered, languidly calling to their servants to fetch a basin of water, dust a coat, or polish a scabbard. Trim, young, mounted orderlies, bearing dispatches obviously unimportant, weaved their way amongst the men enduring with unconcern their good-humored raillery, the penalty of superior station. Little Negroes, of not very clearly defined status and function, lolled on their stomachs or slumbered peacefully, unaware of the practical waggery prepared by white hands for their undoing. Presently, the flag, hanging limp and lifeless at headquarters, was seen to lift itself spiritedly from the staff. At the same instant was heard a dull, distant sound, like the heavy breathing of some great animal below the horizon. The flag had lifted its head to listen. There was a momentary lull in the hum of the human swarm. Then, as the flag drooped, the hush passed away. But there were some hundreds more men on their feet than before, some thousands more hearts beating at a greater pulse. Again the flag made a warning sign, and again the breeze bore to our ears the long, deep sighing of iron lungs. The division, as if it had received the sharp word of command, sprang to its feet and stood in groups at attention. I have since seen similar effects produced by earthquakes. I am not sure, but the ground was shaking then. The mess cooks lifted their steaming camp kettles off of the fire and stood by to cast out. The mounted orderlies had somehow disappeared. 
Officers came ducking from beneath their tents and gathered in groups. Headquarters had become a swarming hive. The sound of the great guns now came in regular throbbings, the strong, full pulse of the fever of battle. The flag flapped excitedly, shaking out its blazonry of stars and stripes with a sort of fierce delight. Toward a knot of officers in its shadow dashed a mounted aide-de-camp, and in the instant rose the sharp, clear notes of a bugle, caught up and repeated, and passed on by other bugles until the level reaches of brown fields, the line of woods trending away to the hills and the unseen valleys beyond were telling of the sound, the farther, fainter strains half drowned in ringing cheers as the men ran to range themselves behind their stacked arms. For this call was not the wearisome general before which the tents go down. It was the exhilarating assembly which goes to the heart as wine and stirs the blood like the kisses of a beautiful woman. Who that has heard it singing to him above the grumble of great guns can forget the wild intoxication of its music? The Confederate forces in Kentucky and Tennessee had suffered a series of reverses, culminating in the loss of Nashville. The blow was severe. Immense quantities of war material had fallen to the victor, together with all of the important points. General Johnston withdrew the Confederate army to Corinth in northern Mississippi, where he hoped so to recruit and equip it as to enable it to assume the offensive and retake the lost territory. The town of Corinth was a wretched place, the capital of a swamp. It is a day's march from the Tennessee River, which runs nearly north, and it is navigable to this point. That is to say, the Tennessee River is navigable to Pittsburgh Landing where Corinth got to it by a road worn through a thickly wooded country seamed with ravines and bayous. The Corinth Road was at a certain season a branch of the Tennessee River, and its mouth was Pittsburgh Landing. Here in 1862 were some fields and a house or two. Now there is a national cemetery and a number of other improvements. It was at Pittsburgh Landing that Grant established his army with the river at his rear and two toy steamboats as a means of communication with the other side. The question has been asked, why did General Grant occupy the enemy's side of the river in the face of a superior enemy before the arrival of General Buell? Buell had a long way to come. Perhaps Grant was weary of waiting. Certainly Johnston was. For in the gray of the early morning of April 6th, the Confederate forces, having moved out of Corinth two days before, fell upon Grant's advance brigades and destroyed them. Grant was at Savannah, but hastened to Pittsburgh Landing in time to find his camps in the hands of the enemy and the remnants of his beaten army cooped up with an impassable river at their rear for moral support. I have related how news of this affair came to us at Savannah, it came on the wind, a messenger that does not bear copious details. Three. Over by Pittsburgh Landing are some low, bare hills. In the dusk of the evening of April 6th, this open space, as seen from the other side of the river, would have appeared to have been ruled in long, dark lines with new lines being constantly drawn across. These lines were the regiments of Buell's leading division, which, having moved up from Savannah through a country presenting nothing but impassable swamps and rank undergrowths of jungle, was arriving at the scene of action, breathless, footsore, and faint with hunger. It had been a terrible race. Some regiments had lost a third of their number from fatigue, the men dropping out of the ranks as if shot and left to recover or die at their leisure. Neither was the scene to which they had been invited likely to inspire. The eyes reported only matter for despair. Before us ran the turbulent river, 
vexed with plunging shells and obscured in spots by blue sheets of low-lying smoke. The two little steamers were doing their job well. They came over to us empty and returned crowded, sitting very low in the water, apparently on the point of capsizing. On the heights above, the battle was burning brightly enough. There were broad flushings in the sky, against which the branches of the trees showed black. The air was full of noises. To the right and left, the musketry rattled smartly and petulantly. Directly in front, it sighed and growled. There were deep, shaking explosions and smart shocks. The whisper of stray bullets and the hurtle of conical shells. The rush of round shot. There were faint cheers. Occasionally, against the glare behind the trees, could be seen moving black figures, singularly distinct, but apparently no larger than a thumb. They seemed to me ludicrously like old allegorical figures of demons in, in old allegorical prints of hell. To destroy these and all of their belongings, the enemy only needed another hour of daylight. Nay, to make his victory sure, it did not need that the sun should pause in the heavens. One of the many random shots falling into the river would have done the business, had chance directed it into the engine room of one of the steamers. You can perhaps fancy the anxiety with which we watched them leaping down. But we had two other allies besides the night. Just where the enemy had pushed his right flank to the river was the mouth of a wide bayou. And here, two gunboats had taken station. They, too, were of the toy sort. They staggered under a heavy gun or two. The bayou made an opening in the high bank of the river. The bank was a parapet behind which the gunboats crouched, firing up the bayou as through an embrasure. The enemy was at this disadvantage. He could not get at the gunboats, and he could advance only by exposing his flank to their ponderous missiles, one of which would have broken a half mile of his bones and made nothing of it. Very annoying this must have been. These 20 gunners beating back an army because a sluggish creek had been pleased to fall into a river at one point rather than another. Such is the part that accident plays in the game of war. As a spectacle, this was rather fine. We could just discern the two black bodies of these boats, looking very much like turtles. But when they let off their big guns, there was a conflagration. The river shuddered in its banks and hurried on, wounded, bloody, terrified. Objects a mile away sprang toward our eyes as a snake strikes at the face of his victim. Then we could hear the great shell tearing away through the air until the sound died out in the distance. Then, a surprisingly long time afterward, a dull, distant explosion and a sudden silence of small arms fire told their own tale. Four. There was, I remember, no elephant on the boat that passed us across that evening. Nor, I think, was there a hippopotamus. These would have been out of place. We had, however, a woman. She was a fine creature, this woman, somebody's wife. Her mission, as she understood it, was to inspire the failing heart with courage. And when she selected mine, I felt less, less flattered by her preference than astonished by her penetration. How did she know? She stood on the upper deck with the red blaze of battle bathing her beautiful face, the twinkle of a thousand rifles mirrored in her eyes, and displaying a small ivory-handled pistol. She told me in a sentence punctuated by the thunder of great guns, that if it came to the worst, she would do her duty like a man. I am proud to remember that I took off my hat to this little fool. Five. 
By the time my regiment had reached the plateau, night had put an end to the struggle. The gunboats blazed away at set, in at set intervals all night long just to break the enemy of his rest. For us, there was no rest. Foot by foot, we moved through the dusky fields. We knew not whither. There were men all about us, but no campfires. To have made a blaze would have been madness. They gathered in groups by the wayside. They recounted the depressing incidents of the day. A thoughtful officer shut their mouths with a sharp word as we passed. <coughs> a wiser one coming after encouraged them to repeat their doleful tales all along the line. Hidden in hollows and behind the clumps of rank brambles were large tents, dimly lidded with candles but looking comfortable. The kind of comfort they supplied was indicated by pairs of men entering and reappearing, bearing litters, the low moans from within and the long rows of dead with covered faces outside. These tents were constantly receiving the wounded, yet they were never full. They were continually ejecting the dead, yet they were never empty. It was as if the helpless had been carried in and murdered, that they might not hamper those whose business it was to fall tomorrow. The night was now black, dark. It had begun to rain. Inch by inch, we crept along, treading on one another's heels by way of keeping together. Very often, we struck our feet against the dead, more frequently against those who still had spirit enough to resent it with a moan. These we lifted carefully to one side and abandoned. Some had sense enough to ask in their weak way for water. <laughs> Absurd. Their clothes were soaken. Their hair dank, their white faces were clammy and cold. Besides, none of us had any water. There was plenty coming, though, for before midnight, a thunderstorm broke upon us with great violence. We moved in running water up to our ankles. Happily, we were in a forest, or an enemy standing close to his guns, or to an enemy standing close to his guns, the disclosures of the lightning might have been inconvenient to us. As it was, the incessant blaze enabled us to consult our watches and encouraged us by displaying our gallant, by displaying our numbers. Our black, sinuous line creeped like a giant serpent through the trees, it was apparently interminable. I am almost ashamed to say how sweet I found the companionship of those coarse men. A few inaudible commands from an invisible leader had placed us in order of battle. But where was the enemy? Had our other divisions arrived during the night and passed the river to assist us? Or were we to oppose our paltry 5,000 breasts against an army flushed with victory? What protected our right? Who lay upon our left? Was there really anything in front? There came, born to us on the raw morning air, the long, weird note of a bugle. It was directly before us. It rose with a low, clear, deliberate warble and seemed to float in the gray sky like the note of a lark. The bugle calls of the Federal and Confederate armies were the same. It was the assembly. As it died away, I observed that the atmosphere had suffered a change. It was electric. Wings were growing on blistered feet. Bruised muscles and jolted bones, shoulders pounded by the cruel knapsack, eyelids leaden from lack of sleep, all were pervaded with the subtle fluid, all were unconscious of their clay. The men thrust forward their heads, expanded their eyes, and clenched their teeth. They breathed hard, as if being throttled by the tugging of a leash. If you had laid your hand in the beard or hair of one of these men, it would have crackled and shot sparks. Six. Six. <coughs> 
I suppose the country lying between Corinth and Pittsburgh Landing could boast a few inhabitants other than alligators. What manner of people they were, it is impossible to say, inasmuch as the fighting dispersed or possibly exterminated them. Perhaps in merely classifying them as non-lizard, I shall describe them with sufficient particularity and at the same time divert from myself the natural suspicion attaching to a writer who points out to persons who do not know him the peculiarities of persons he does not know. One thing, however, I hope I may without offense affirm of these swamp dwellers, they were pious. To what deity their veneration was given, whether like the Egyptians they worshiped the crocodile or like other Americans adored themselves, I do not presume to guess. But whoever or whatever may have been the divinity whose ends they shaped unto him or it, they had built a temple. This humble edifice, centrally situated in the heart of a forest and conveniently accessible to crows, had been christened Shiloh Chapel, whence the name of the battle. The fact of a Christian church giving name to a wholesale cutting of Christian throats by Christian hands need not be dwelt on here. The frequency of its recurrence in the history of our species has somewhat abated the moral interest that would otherwise attach to it. So, owing to the darkness, the storm, and the absence of a road, it had been impossible to move the artillery from the open ground around the landing. Our batteries were probably toiling after us somewhere. We could only hope that the enemy might delay his attack until they should arrive. He may delay his defense, if he like, said a sententious young officer to whom I had imparted this, natu this natural wish. He had read the signs right. The words were hardly spoken when a group of staff officers about the brigade commander shot as if scattered by a whirlwind and galloping each to the commander of a regiment gave the word. There was a momentary confusion of tongues, and a thin line of skirmishers detached itself from the compact front and pushed forward, followed by its diminutive reserves of half a company each, one of which platoons it was my fortune to command. When the straggling line of skirmishers had swept four or five hundred yards ahead, see, said one of my comrades, <coughs> she moves, and indeed she did in fine style, her front as straight as a string, her reserve regiments in columns doubled on the center, following in true subordination. No braying of brass to apprise the enemy, no fifing and drumming to amuse him, no ostentation of gaudy flags, no nonsense. This was a matter of business. Now the evidence of the previous day's struggle was present in profusion. The ground was tolerably level here, the forest less dense, mostly clear of undergrowth, and occasionally opening out into small natural meadows. Here and there were small pools, mere disks of rainwater with a tinge of blood. Torn with cannon shot, the trunks of the trees protruded branches and splinters like hands the fingers above the wound interlacing with those below. Large branches had been lopped and hung in their green heads to the ground. Angular bits of iron sticking in the sides of muddy depressions showed where shells had exploded in their furrows. Knapsacks, canteens, haversacks distended and soaken with swollen biscuits. Blankets beaten into the soil by rain, rifles with bent barrels or splintered stocks, waist belts, hats, and the omnipresent sardine box. All the wretched debris of the battle still littered the spongy earth as far as you could see. In every direction. Dead horses were everywhere. A few disabled caissons, ammunition wagons standing disconsolate behind four or six sprawling mules. 
men. Uh, there were men enough, all dead, apparently, except one who lay near where I had halted my platoon to await the slower movement of the line. A federal sergeant, variously hurt, who had been a fine giant in his time. <coughs> he lay face upward, taking in his breath in convulsive, rattling snorts and blowing it out in sputters of froth which crawled creamily down his cheeks, piling itself alongside his neck and ears. A bullet had clipped a groove in his skull above the temple. From this, the brain protruded in bosses, dropping off in flakes and strings. I had not previously known that one could get on, even in this unsatisfactory fashion, with so little brain. One of my men asked if he should put his bayonet through him. Inexpressibly shocked by the cold-blooded proposal, I told him I thought not. It was unusual, and too many were watching. Eight. It was plain that the enemy had retreated to Corinth. The arrival of our fresh troops had disheartened him. Three or four of his gray cavalry videttes moving amongst the trees on the crest of the hill in our front confirmed us in our belief. An army in the face of the enemy does not employ cavalry to watch its front. True, they might have been a general in his staff. Crowning this rise, we found a level field, a quarter of a mile in width. Beyond it, a gentle acclivity, covered with an undergrowth of young oaks, impervious to sight. We pushed on into the open, but the division halted at the edge. Having orders to conform to its movements, we halted too, but that would not suit. We received an intimation to proceed. I had performed this sort of service before, and in the exercise of my discretion, deployed my platoon, pushing it forward at a run with trailed arms to strengthen the skirmish line, which I overtook some 30 or 40 yards from the woods. Then, I can't describe it, the forest seemed all at once to flame up and disappear with a crash like that of a great wave upon the beach. A crash that expired in hot hissings and the sickening spat of lead against flesh. A dozen of my brave fellows tumbled over like ten pins. Some struggled to their feet only to go down again and yet again. Those who stood fired into the smoking brush and doggedly retired. We had expected to find, at most, a line of skirmishers similar to our own. It was with a view to overcoming them at the point of contact that I had thrown forward my little reserve. What we found was a line of battle, coolly holding its fire until it could count our teeth. There was no more to be done but get back across the open ground, every yard of which was throwing up its little jet of mud provoked by an impinging bullet. Uh, we got back, most of us, and I shall never forget the ludicrous incident of a young officer who had taken part in the affair walking up to his colonel, who had been a calm and apparent impartial spectator, and gravely reporting, the enemy is in force just beyond this field, sir. Nine, in subordination to the design of this narrative, the incidents related necessarily grouped themselves around my own personality as a center. And as this center, during the few terrible hours of the engagement, maintained a variably constant relation to this field, I will describe it. The configuration of the ground offered us no protection. By lying flat on our faces between the cannons, we were screened from view by a straggling row of brambles which marked the course of some obsolete fence. But the enemy's grape was sharper than his eyes, and it was poor consolation to know that his gunners could not see what they were doing so long as they did it to us. The shock of our own pieces nearly deafened us. But in the brief intervals, we could hear the battle roaring and stammering in the dark reaches of the forest to the right and to the left. 
where our other divisions were dashing themselves again and again into the smoking jungle. What would we have not given but to join them in their brave, hopeless task? But to lie inglorious amid showers of shrapnel and meekly be blown out of existence by level gusts of grape, this was horrible. Oh, those cursed guns, uh, not the enemies, our own. Had it not been for them, we might have died like men. They must be supported. It was impossible to conceive that these pieces were doing the enemy as excellent a mischief as his were doing us. And it was with grim satisfaction that I saw the carriage of one and another smashed into matchwood by whooping shot and bundled out of the line. Take a moment here to take another look at a map. This is from Tim Smith's Shiloh Conqueror Parish, a fine history of the Battle of Shiloh that I recommend. Here, Sergeant Bierce's uh, recollections will part from the facts of history a little bit. He will, rec he will uh, describe having visited a ravine uh, some several hundred yards to the east of his position. His position would have been here. And the climax of our story involves a fight here. He now describes activity that occurred here. And while he describes it, where he places himself actually would have been behind the Confederate lines at the time. But Bierce was not mistaken, nor did he really care about history. He was a writer. His goal was to write a good story. And so it didn't matter to him if he played with the timeline a little bit in order to put part 10 where he put it. The dense forests, wholly or partly, in which were fought so many battles of the Civil War, lay upon the earth in each autumn a thick deposit of dead leaves and stems, the decay of which forms a soil of surprising depth and richness. In dry weather, the upper stratum is flammable as tinder. A fire once kindled in it will spread with a slow, persistent advance as far as local conditions will permit, leaving a bed of light ashes beneath which the less combustible accretions of the previous year will smolder until extinguished by rains. In many of the engagements of the war, the fallen leaves took fire and roasted the fallen men. At Shiloh, during the first day's fighting, wide tracts of woodland were burned over in this way, and scores of wounded who might have recovered perished in slow torture. I remember a deep ravine in which, by some mad freak of heroic incompetence, a part of an Illinois regiment had been surrounded, and refusing to surrender was destroyed, as it very well deserved. My regiment, Having at last been relieved at the guns for no obvious purpose, I obtained leave to go down into the valley of death and gratify a reprehensible curiosity. The fire had swept every foot of it, and at every step I sank into ashes to the ankle. It had contained a thick undergrowth of young saplings, every one of which was severed by a bullet and afterward burnt. The stumps were charred. Death had put its sickle into this thicket, and fire had gleaned the field. Along a line, which was not that of the extreme depression, but was equidistant from the heights on either hand, lay the bodies, half buried in ashes. Some, in the unlovely looseness of attitude denoting sudden death by the bullet, but by far the greater number in postures of agony that told of the tormenting flame. Their clothing was half burnt away, their hair and beard entirely. The rain had come too late to save their nails. Some were swollen to double girth, others shriveled to mannequins. According to the degree of exposure, their faces were bloated and black or yellow and shrunken. The contraction of muscles which had given them claws for hands had cursed each countenance with a hideous grin. Fa. I cannot catalog 
the charms of these gallant gentlemen who had got what they enlisted for. Eleven. For fifteen hours, we had been wet to the skin, profoundly disgusted with the inglorious part to which we had been condemned. The men of my regiment did everything doggedly. Blue sheets of powder smoke filled the air with their peculiar, pungent odor. For miles on either hand could be heard the hoarse murmur of the battle. We had been placed again in the rear of those guns, but even they and their antagonists seemed to have tired of the feud, pounding away at each other with amiable infrequency. The right of the regiment extended a little bit beyond the field into the woods. On the prolongation of the line in that direction were some regiments of some other division, with one in reserve. The line of the forest bounding the end of the field stretched as straight as a wall from the right of my regiment to heaven knows what regiment of the enemy. There suddenly appeared, marching down along this wall, not more than 200 yards in our front, a few dozen gray-clad men with rifles at the right shoulder. At an interval of 50 yards behind them, they were, they were followed by perhaps half as many more. And in a fair supporting distance of these, stalked with confident stride, a single man. There seemed to me something indescribably ludicrous in the advance of this handful of men upon an army albeit with their left flank protected by a forest. It does not so impress me now. They were the exposed flanks of three lines of infantry, each a half mile in length. In a moment, our gunners had grappled with the nearest pieces and swung them half around and were pouring streams of canister into the woods. The infantry rose in masses, springing into line. Our threatened regiments stood like a wall, their loaded rifles at ready. The right wing of my regiment was thrown slightly back so that, as to threaten the flank of the assault. Then the storm burst. A great cloud seemed to spring out of the forest into the faces of the waiting battalions. It was received with a crash that made the trees turn up their very leaves. For one instant, the assailants paused above their dead. Then they struggled forward. One moment, and those unmoved men in blue would be impaled. What were they about? Were they stunned by their own volley? Why did they not fire? The inaction was maddening. Another tremendous crash. The rear rank had fired. Humanity, thank heaven, is not made for this and the shattered gray mass drew back a score of paces. Lead had scored its old-time victory over steel. The heroic had broken its great heart against the commonplace. There are those who say that it is sometimes otherwise. All of this had taken but a minute of time, and now the second Confederate line swept down and poured in its fire, the line of blue staggered and gave way. In those two terrific volleys, it seemed to have quite poured out its spirit. To this deadly work, our reserves now came up at a run. It was surprising to see them spitting fire with never a sound, for such was the infernal din that the ear could take in no more. This fearful scene was enacted within 50 paces of our toes, but we were rooted to the ground as if we had grown there. But now our commanding officer rode from behind us to the front, waved his hand with a courteous gesture that says, Après vous. And with a barely audible cheer, we sprang into the fight. Again, the smoking front of gray receded, and again, as the enemy's third line emerged from its leafy covert, it pushed forward across the piles of dead and wounded, threatening with protruded steel. As matters stood, we were now very evenly matched. And how long we might have held out, God only knows. But 
All at once, something appeared to have gone wrong with the enemy's left. Our men had somewhere pierced his line. A moment later, his whole front gave way, and springing forward with fixed bayonets, and springing forward with fixed bayonets, we pushed him in utter confusion back to his original line. Here, amid the broken and disordered regiments, inextricably intermingled and drunken with the wine of triumph, we dashed confidently against a pair of battalions, provoking a tempest of hissing lead that made us stagger in its very weight. The sharp onset of another battalion against our flank sent us whirling back with fire at our heels and fresh foes in merciless pursuit, who in their turn were broken on the front of our reserves. As we rallied to reform behind our beloved guns, we noted the ridiculous brevity of our line. As we sank from sheer fatigue and tried to moderate the terrific thumping of our hearts, there swept past us and over us into the open field a long regiment with fixed bayonets and rifles at right shoulder. Another followed, and another, two, three, Four, heavens, where do all of these men come from and, and why did they not come before? How grandly and confidently they go sweeping on like long blue waves of ocean chasing one another to the cruel rocks. Involuntarily, we draw in our feet beneath us as we sit ready to spring up and interpose our breasts when these gallant lines shall come tumbling back across the terrible field with spouting fires at their backs. We still are breathing to catch the full grandeur of the volleys that will tear them to shreds. Minute after minute passes and the sound does not come. Then, for the first time, we note that the silence of the whole region is not comparative, but absolute. Have we become deaf? See, here comes a stretcher bearer, and there a surgeon. Good heavens, a chaplain! The battle was indeed at an end. Well, and this was oh so long ago. How they come back to me, dimly and brokenly, but with what a magic spell. Those years of youth when I was soldiering. Again, I hear the far warble of blown bugles. Again, I see the tall blue smoke of campfires ascending from the dim valleys of Wonderland. There steals upon my sense the ghost of an odor from pines that canopy an ambush. I feel upon my cheek the morning mist that shrouds the hostile camp, unaware of its doom and my blood stirs at the ringing rifle shot of the solitary sentinel. Unfamiliar landscapes, glittering with sunshine or sullen with rain, come to me demanding recognition, pass, vanish, and give place to others. Here in the night stretches a wide and blasted field studded with half-extinct fires, burning redly with I know not what presage of evil. Again, I shudder as I note its desolation and its awful silence. Where was it? To what monstrous and harmony of death was it the prelude? O oh, days 
when all the world was beautiful and strange. When unfamiliar constellations burned in the southern midnights and the mockingbird poured out its heart in the moon-gilded magnolia. When there was something new under a new sun. Will your fine, far memories ever cease to lay contrasting pictures athwart the harsher features of this later world, accentuating the ugliness of the longer and tamer life? Is it not strange that the phantoms of a blood-stained period have so airy a grace and look with so tender eyes? That I recall with difficulty the danger and death and horrors of the time, and without effort, all that was gracious and picturesque. Ah, youth, there is no such wizard as thou. Give me but one touch of thine artist hand upon the dull canvas of the present. Gild but for one moment the drear and somber scenes of today, and I will willingly surrender another life than the one I should have thrown away at Shiloh. Thank you. Thank you, Fred. I'm ready for questions if we have time. Yeah.